All right, it is sermon request time. I saw one of you in the comments wrote and they and said, could you please do a study on biblical masculinity? What does it mean to be a man according to the scriptures? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20 is where we'll start. You can turn there. Um, and I was going over this thing in my mind and I was thinking, you know, um, what are the scriptures? What are the arguments? I know what it takes to be a man, but how does secular understanding line up with the scriptures? And I'm going through all these things. And I was thinking of this big elaborate study and whatever, and, and, you know, praying about it. And the Lord revealed this to me. Um, I did the thing on your God given rights and basically separated it into three different categories. Uh, and that is because we are made up of three different parts. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit, and each one has a different function. And um, so with the spirit in the your God-given rights, you have the free will of your mind. With your soul, you have personal defense, that you can feel certain things, you can feel danger, and you don't understand it. There's nothing that you can see with your eyes or understand, oh, hey, I'm in a really bad spot, but you can just feel kind of a, oh, I feel uneasy. That's your soul. And then the third thing that you have in terms of body, soul, spirit would be your body. You have spirit as your mind. Soul is your personal defense, what you feel, free will, personal defense. Your body is bodily integ integrity. Nobody has a right to come and touch you or put something in you or take control of your body. Um, that's one of your unalienable rights. You can't make any laws against that to take away that uh, bodily integrity. Okay. Nobody has a right to tell you what to do with your body, period. All right. So if you say, well, somebody did tell me, well, then they've taken away your God-given rights and you should fight against that. God will defend you if you stick by the scriptures and say, I have a free will. I have the right to defend myself, you know, by, in a lot of different ways. There, in terms of you can't take away my liberty, you can't take away my freedom of speech, other things like that. And then thirdly, you can't take away my bodily integrity. You can't tell me what to do with my body. You can't tell me what to eat. You can't tell me that I have to be injected with certain things. Um, you can't tell me I have to take drugs or whatever else. You can't do that. Uh, you don't have the freedom for that. Well, what's that have to do with this study? Well, you have three different things there. Um, that line up with the spirit, soul, and body. So I have my notes right here written out, all nicely uh, figured out here. The Lord revealed it to me. First you have understanding, then you have righteous, and then you have strong. Okay, so um, your spirit would be the understanding, the soul would be the righteousness there, and your body would be the strength. Okay, uh, Biblical masculinity would be righteous, it would be strong, it would also have understanding. Now let's go through the scriptures to prove my point. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 20, it says here, Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be children, but in understanding be men. Biblical masculinity requires understanding. It requires that you get away from childhood. Stop, stop acting like a child. Um, you have to go out there and you have to work for a living. You have to go out there and you have to take certain responsibilities. If somebody comes to the door here, over here is the straight coming over here to the door is why I'm pointing that way in our office here. They come to the door and they, and they bang on the door. I can't say, oh, you know, honey, can you get that oh, to my wife? Please go get that. See what the guy wants. You know, what's he want? You know, or stand in here and suck my thumb or something. No, I'm the man of the house. I have to go out there and take care of that situation. Be not children in understanding. Don't be a child when it comes to understanding what the Bible says. I, you know, I have never been able to understand how people get offended at a preacher. I mean, I get offended if a preacher's an idiot. I don't really, it's not offended. It's more just annoyed. You know, the guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And he's just, you know, some Catholic and he's up there yelling and screaming, don't you speak against the man of God or whatever, you know. Well, I get annoyed by that, but I don't get offended. I'm not, oh, he's, he raised his voice, uh, you know, or something. No, I'm not going to be a child. Oh, he's yelling. Oh, he scares me. Whatever. What's the guy saying? Is he saying something good? Okay, I'll listen to him. Oh, okay. Praise the Lord. I got some 
um, blessings from what the guy was saying. Don't be a child in understanding. Understand the way that a man would understand things. Take responsibility. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 Key scripture for you as a Christian man. You have to take certain responsibilities. Don't waste your life away sitting in your parents' place playing video games. Okay? Take chances. Go out and do things. Whatever else. Understand what it means to be a man, in other words. To get out on your own and, and do things like that. Well, Brother Brian, don't make excuses, okay? <laughs> I've done stupid things in my past. And so don't come and say, well, I know Brother Brian was at home for a while and he played video games for a while. Yeah, it was sin. And I speak from experience and say it was very bad for me. It was very terrible. Don't waste your life away like I once did. Um, but a lot of people f seem to forget that try to use me as a, well, see, you're being a hypocrite because you once did what I'm doing currently. And so therefore it's okay if I do it. You know, No, I started working when I was a boy. I was a teenager, 14 years old is when I got my first job. Okay, I was working before I could even drive. And I worked for many years after that. So I'm not the same as, you know, a lot of the youths out there that are just going out and doing whatever and they don't want to get a job and whatever else. You have to understand what it means to be a man. Proverbs chapter 1. Go back to Proverbs chapter 1. I... Uh, I determined years ago when the Lord put me into the ministry, I determined that I was going to speak very plainly and very bluntly. And a lot of what I say sounds to be like it's very offensive and very arrogant and whatever, prideful. I get all that stuff put on me. I say things so that you can understand me very clearly and very plainly. And I'm trying to challenge you to make you think on your own. That's what I do. A lot of people doesn't appeal to them very much and they get angry at me and they I'm shutting off this and I'm never watching another video. That guy's a nut and whatever. You're not understanding what I'm trying to say. I come from a place of love and charity. I really honestly do. Um, and I love you enough to tell you the truth. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 1 through 7. The Proverbs of Solomon of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. You have to grow up and be a man and understand things. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. To give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. It doesn't just mean the Bible either, by the way. Um, I listen to a lot of secular teachers and, and things. I've listened to uh, uh, lectures from Yale and Harvard. What? You know? Yeah, I'll listen to different men. I have to study some sort of a subject for a sermon or whatever else. I'll look up some kind of a thing. I mean, the, the Internet's a great blessing for that reason. I mean, it can be a really bad cursing as well. There's a lot of very wicked things online. But there's some really smart people that put out things uh, on YouTube and on other platforms and whatever else. I want to hear from experts. If I want to learn about the military, I'm not going to look for a Baptist preacher or some other preacher or something that talks about the military. I want to look up, here's a colonel, here's a general telling about their experiences. And I can tell very quickly, oh, they're just, you know, not really telling the truth or here this guy is actually telling the truth and he's getting people are attacking him and calling him a nut and whatever else. Oh, here, I, I need to know, hear about the uh, drug trafficking thing. Well, I want to listen to this guy about the, you know, he was with the Drug Enforcement uh, Agency or whatever the thing, DEA. Uh, I want to hear from him. Tell me about it. Explain it to me. I want to hear some guy that's been in it all of his life. Oh, here's a professor so-and-so from Yale University, and he's got a teaching on whatever. Oh, here's a lecture from West Point University. I want to hear that. Okay. Attain unto wise counsels. Study. Learn. Educate yourself. That's what men do. Um, real men don't sit around watching other men on television in tight clothing playing with a ball. Okay? 
<laughs> um, throw the ball to me. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> He's got the ball. Hit him. Knock him down. Ooh. <laughs> Attain unto wise counsels. You're wasting your time with sports. One of the worst wastes of time that there is. Oh, not me. I like Hollywood movies. What are you doing, punk? You ready for a gunfight? You know? Oh, oh, wow, man, what a real man. Wow. That guy in that movie, that cowboy movie, boy, whew, he can sure draw his gun fast. Uh, yeah, and they probably had to do it how many times to get it just the scene just right? Uh, cut, cut. Okay, let's try that one more time. <laughs> and those are real men that you look up to? No, they're not. No, they're not. Uh, don't waste your time with movies. Don't waste your time with video games. Don't waste your time with sports. Don't waste your time with that. Um, attain unto wise counsels. I watch atheists sometimes. I want to hear what they have to say. I want to hear their arguments. I watch Catholic priests. I watch Jesuits. Why? Because they're wise. <gasps> he just said Jesuits are wise. They are. They're very wise in the evil schemings and things that they do. I want to know. I want to learn. I want to study. What are these people actually saying? What are they teaching? Verse 6. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Hmm. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Do you fear God? If you do, you'll attain unto wise counsels and you'll say, okay, I'll sort out this guy here. Well, I won't listen to that guy. Am I understanding what he's saying here? I'm listening in terms of I'm hearing, but I'm not going to do what he says because he doesn't fear God. He's not a saved man. See? Increase your understanding. Don't increase your under entertainment. I'm a real man because I can tell you who won the Super Bowl 10 years ago. <sighs> Oh, woo, whoop de doo uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Well, not me, brother. I, I'm a NASCAR guy. Yeah. NHRA, National Hot Rod Association. I know who can, who is a, what the fastest car is, the best motor, and that you're wasting your time. Ephesians chapter 5. Children are the ones that like to be entertained, by the way, not men. Men want to increase their understanding and their learning so that they can be better husbands and better fathers and better Christians. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11 through 20, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. You know, you'll get to a point where you'll look back and you'll think about all the stuff that you've wasted your time on. The movies, the sports, the video games, the whatever. And you just think... Boy, am I going to answer for that. That was so stupid. Why did I waste my time? Oh, oh, Lord. Minimize that stuff, you see? Wean yourself off of that. Replace it with understanding and with learning and attaining unto wise counsel. Hey, I don't really understand what this whole stock market thing is, but maybe I should try to learn about the stock market. Hey, I, I don't really understand the thing of precious metals investing, and maybe I should try to get into understanding what's that all about what you know hear the arguments on both sides okay hey what happens if something goes wrong with my vehicle maybe i should start to try to learn to work on my own vehicle um is there a way oh, oh looks like my lights are going out maybe i should try to figure out how to do some wiring repairs oh what's that oh the sink's not working correctly the faucet's not working maybe i should try to learn how to fix the sink Hey, there's some bad times coming. There could be power outages here in America. Maybe I should try to figure out how to have my home run and function without electricity from the power grid. Hmm. 
Is there a way I can pay off my debts? Is there a way that I can have myself and my family in better nutritional health? Maybe I should cut out junk food from my life. Understanding the mark of a real man. And don't make excuses for where you're at. Get some understanding. Uh, verse 17 here. Wherefore be ye not unwise. That's a command, by the way. Be ye not unwise. But understanding what the will of the Lord is. What's God's will for your life? Do you understand what it is? Well, I just kind of, you know, you live from day to day, you know, and, and whatever. No, you really want to try to understand what God's will is for your life. Verse 18, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, you know, it's tough. <laughs> Those of you out there that are just as stupid as I once was, um, and you listen to all that rock music and everything else back before you got saved, and and just again, I don't understand. How did we go from grocery stores and department stores having calming, soothing music to kind of keep you in the store and whatever to now you go in there and it's '80s classic rock or something? <laughs> you know, Guns and Roses and Bon Jovi and and you know. Whatever, I mean, I guess it'll eventually be Metallica and Megadeth and, you know, whatever else. I mean, it's where I'm at. I don't know where you're at. It's probably, you know, if you're more towards the cities or something, maybe they play Britney Spears or something. They were loudspeakers. I don't know. But <laughs> where I'm at, they play classic rock, and it drives me nuts. And I'm going through there, and I'm thinking, oh, man, I used to listen to this song all the time. And, and, my, and I know the lyrics, and my mind starts going, yeah, and stop, stop. And then you have to fight that. And you say, Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain free to all. You know, and you're trying to get it in your head. And, and about that time, your mind starts to go, you know, oh, back towards the music again. <laughs> and it's fighting. That's what it means to be a man. Understanding understanding this stuff is toxic. This stuff is trying to mess my head up. They had a suggestion box at the one grocery store and it said, do you have any suggestions for how our store, how we could make it more pleasant? I took a note and I wrote, please stop with the rock music. It's very annoying. It's very frustrating and whatever else. And uh, they stopped playing it. At least for a little while. I think they're back to it now, but uh, they don't have it as loud as it once was. But uh, do something, you know, what you can to fight this stuff. James chapter 5, verse 16. We're going to talk about the next thing of biblical masculinity. Again, understanding is your spirit, the spirit of your mind. You understand what the will of God is. You understand how to get wisdom. You understand all the different things of life, and you attain unto wise counsel to increase your understanding. That's what a man does. Uh, stays away from... A lot of entertainment and whatever else but go to James chapter 5 oh you don't know what it's like brother Brian you don't understand it oh I understand very well I understand I was never much into sports and whatever but motor sports I was more into um, because it was a lot more adrenaline seeking than you know running down the field with a ball under my arm or something or kicking a ball. Doop, doop, doop. <laughs> I was forced to do that stuff in high school, and, you know, and growing up through different schools. I was on Little League, and then I was on basketball team. But I hated it. Both times I hated it. But uh, motorsports, different story entirely. Um, you know, all the different stuff. It, I had, had the whole vehicle testimony thing. I've been into a lot of different types of motorcycles, and, you know, dirt bikes, four-wheelers, three-wheelers, you know, big trucks, fast cars, the whole thing. Um, but I have to look at that stuff now and say, does it help me? I want to be a man of understanding. Uh, James chapter 5, verse 16. Let's talk now about righteous 
being a righteous man, biblical masculinity. Uh, James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Um, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me, the Bible says. Uh, are you a righteous man? Again, I've talked to a lot of men that profess to be Christians, and they'll say, well, I'm no saint, you know, but I, I don't do this, I don't do that. Uh, well, if you're saved, you are a saint. Okay, don't get into the Catholic thing of sainthood is something that you eventually get. You have to be out of, you know, be first, uh, I don't forget the order of it, but then you have to, be, you, once you're beatified, then you can event, you eventually become a saint or something, and you have to have, see a vision of angels or some other, of Mary or something, and you have to do certain things. I mean, no, 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 no. Um, a saint just means you're saved. Okay, you're born again as a Christian. That's what it means. Um, and you better keep that in mind. You're not like the lost people out there in the world. There's supposed to be righteous standards in your life. You say, hey, that's right. I know that this is the right thing to do. I'm going to do that. That's being righteous. Okay? Um, and there are a lot of lost people. Let me just say this. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to un unto any people. The Bible teaches that in the book of Proverbs. Uh, there are lost people that can have righteous standards. And God can bless a nation because of righteous lost people. All right? He won't take them to heaven. They don't automatically get to heaven. Please understand what I'm saying here. But lost people can have righteous standards. And if they don't have any examples out there, how, does, how do lost people get righteous standards? By seeing righteous men that are saved. See? Explain it that way. Uh, why do presidents still try to act like they're Christians? Um, because there are righteous men in this nation that hold up the Bible as the standard. We have to hold up a higher standard. That's what it means to be a biblical man. Biblical masculinity. You see how it all ties together? And when you are a righteous man, effectual fervent prayer will avail much. God will answer your prayers. Why is America falling apart? Because there's not very many righteous men anymore. And they don't effectually fervently pray. They're, you know, praying about things that are not really in line with the scriptures. It's not effectual, in other words. Go back to Proverbs chapter 3. And this study could have been a lot more scripture. I mean, you could go over huge amounts of scripture. But I um, just want to keep it to the point. I don't want to lose the point here of this study. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27 uh, down to the end there in verse 20, or in 35, rather. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Say not unto thy neighbor, Go and come again, and tomorrow I will give, when thou hast it by thee. Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. Strive not with a man without cause, if he have done thee no harm. Envy thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways. For the froward is an is abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesseth the habitation of the just. Surely he scorneth, scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. Being a real man means that you can understand your relationship to your neighbors. I literally just, I was going to get these studies done uh, a few days ago here, but uh, I was working with my neighbors. Um, some farmers from the area, They, I had that old backhoe down behind the office, and the guy stopped in, offered me money and whatever, and I said, no, you know what? If I said, I don't know if the thing runs. I can't really feel good about you paying me for something. It might be completely shot. I don't know. And it's going to take you some you know, real headache to get the thing out of the back there. I said, if you want it, you can have it. And he said, really? Are you sure? I'm, yeah, sure. Absolutely. And so they came and backed their truck down in, had an old truck and he, you know, had to winch it out and they tried to put air in the tires and the one tire wouldn't hold air. And I mean, they're going to have a lot of work in front, you know, before them. And, and they got the thing out of here, rutted up my yard really bad and everything, which I don't care about the yard. <laughs> That's fine. But I was out there working 
That's why I have sunburn on my face, if you can see that. Um, out there helping my neighbors. Uh, oh, then you witness, you preach the gospel to them. No, what I did is I helped them. And I said some things to them, tried to plant some seeds. But this winning souls, win souls, win souls, just get the gospel preached to everybody. That's manly. It's, it's, it's a, not, excuse me, not manly. It's, it's man-centered. It's fleshly. Um, if God doesn't open a door to witness to somebody, then don't go and try to force things on people because it doesn't make any sense to most people. You increase uh, your relationship to neighbors and to people like that and things. This soul winning thing, understand the soul winning movement. First of all, the book of Proverbs here where it talks about he that winneth souls is wise. It has nothing to do with preaching the gospel. It's talking about being a having good personality and, and winning people and to your side, essentially. It has nothing to do with preaching the gospel. The gospel wasn't even there in the Old Testament. Jesus didn't die on the cross. So how could it, winning souls mean, you know, preaching the gospel? See, it was all a scam. If you haven't seen my study on the dangers of hyper soul winning, uh, I talked about that. It was all part of the 20th century's uh, selling of people to get them into the church buildings to make more money. That's what it is. Um, in the book of Acts, chapter 8, you have Philip walking along and the Lord says, there's a chariot over there with that Ethiopian eunuch in it. Go join yourself to it. God tells him to go and he goes over and the guy's reading Isaiah chapter 53 and he says, you know, he's reading it and whatever. And, and you know, Philip's walking along and he says, understandest thou what thou readest? How can I except some man guide me? Hey, come on up. You know how to interpret this? Come on up. I'd, who's he it's speaking about here? Read Acts chapter 8. You can read about that. God sets up appointments, in other words. We don't. It isn't some kind of a thing where we're Jehovah's Witnesses and we have to go out there and we have to get so many people, you know, we have to go to so many doors, knock so many doors, and then we can prove that we're good Christians. All right? I have to just go off on this rant here. And it's, it gets into this thing, this fleshly thing of, you know, some guy can be a total pervert, messing around, you know, cheating on his wife, whatever. But if he's a soul winner, oh man, oh, hands off. I remember Jack Hiles, they literally had a guy that was convicted of child molestation, molesting children that were on the bus route, and he went to prison for it, and they gave him an award while he's in prison for being a great soul winner. Huh? You can watch my Jack Hiles Exposed videos if you want to learn more about that whole satanic cult out there. But this bizarre thing about this winning souls and whatever else, that makes you a real Christian man. No, what makes you a real Christian man is understanding things having understanding uh, and righteous standards, personal righteousness. That's what makes you a real Christian man. And then the Lord will give you divine appointments. He will say, okay, bring this guy in here. And you get to know people. No, I'm just going to take the, just take the Bible and say, you will listen to me. I'm going to cram this thing down your throat. And you, you, you need to be saved. I'm, going to, I'm not coming off your porch. I'm not leaving your porch until you give, make a decision. I'm going to get you to pray a prayer. You will pray the prayer before I leave today. It's not of God, brethren. It is not of God. It's not how man handles things. A biblical man will get to know people. And he'll wait for the Lord's timing. Years ago, I've told this story many times, but for new people that are just coming along, just watching this for the first time, had a neighbor that was a drunken Roman Catholic. And I mean drunken. We go and the guy just profanity, just bleep, 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 bleep. And uh, I'd, I'd want to witness to him and we'd be praying fervently. My wife and I, you know, we'd go over to our property. We had a right of way that went back through his property. And he'd be out and, hey, how you doing? And we'd go up there and he'd say, I'm Tom Mary. I'm from Brooklyn. And he'd, you know, and he'd be talking and, okay, Tom, all right. Well, we just had to go back to our property. Yeah, it's good to see you again. I'm Tom Mary from Brooklyn. <laughs> And, and just, uh, and occasionally we'd come there and he'd say, oh, hey, you know, how you doing? And, oh, he's actually sober. And we'd go over and, you know, one, one year we gave him a bunch of Christmas cookies and a gospel tract and, and uh, at Christmas time. And another time we gave, you know, other things and tried to talk to him about the Lord. And we just prayed and prayed. And finally, years later, uh, after about three years, I think it was, of knowing the guy, I went the one day and he's completely sober. And, uh, 
and I remember I, I started talking to him and um, we got on the subject of salvation. The seeds that we had planted, now finally it's time to preach the gospel to this guy. And I preached the gospel to the guy. The Lord opened up the door and he got mad at me and he said, I will never believe what you believe. Never. And he said, I knew a Baptist years ago and he said, he said the same stuff that you're saying to me today. And he said, I reject that. He said, Bible, he said, Bible makes me crazy when I try to read it. I don't want anything to do with the Bible. I said, okay. All right, Tom. And I turned and I walked away and I said, okay, Lord. I tried. I waited all these years for the right opportunity. I had to wait till he was sober. I mean, there's so many stories I could tell about that guy. And within about a month, he was dead. I washed my hands of that guy. I just said, I'm done. And there's other people in the area. I talk to them occasionally. You know, I know I'm supposedly a hermit that hides behind a camera and whatever else. But uh, the worst thing that you can do is to go out and take a camera, you know, putting the camera in people's faces and tell me how, you know, are you saved? If you died today, would you go to heaven? You don't need to do that stuff. Uh, you're just putting people on the spot like that and then they feel weird. No, okay, I guess I have to say yes or I have to get in an argument with this guy. Or, come on, you don't need to do that. Oh, it gets lots of views on YouTube. Congratulations there. Uh, super stud, whatever. Um, I will wait on the Lord's timing. It's not, you know, that I don't want to witness to people. Oh, I love to talk to people about the Lord. I'll do it in a store. I'll do it in front of lots of people. Uh, I've gathered a crowd sometimes, uh, different times when I get to witness to somebody. But I don't get into some kind of yelling match and whatever else with people. And I've gone to the, I've done the door to door thing. I've done the street preaching thing and whatever else. And that stuff can get really carnal. And you start, you start to think to yourself, Oh, look at me. I've, I preach on the street. I go door to door. I've led thousands to the Lord. Okay. Where are they now? Watch out for that stuff. There's a lot of pride in the, uh, circles out there. Baptists especially have their kings of the pride system. <laughs> um, first Peter chapter three, possibly more ways than one on that pride issue, but we won't get into that. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 through 17. We'll talk a little bit more about righteousness here to prove that you're a Christian man. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 through 17. Um, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing knowing that ye are there unto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, like a real man should, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. You want to be a real man? Clean up your language. There's a lot of really good things in vocabulary, the English vocabulary, that you can use to uh, explain things. You'll hear me say a lot of it, stupid, ridiculous nonsense, and this is guy's idiotic. And You don't have to use profanity. And when I, whenever I see somebody and they're just F this, F that, and whatever else, I think there's somebody of very low IQ, somebody who's a, not a real man. I'm not impressed by men that can use lots of profanity. I'm not. I'm impressed by a man that can use good vocabulary that's not profanity and put people down or put situations down like a real man should without having to resort to a lot of, of filthy language. That's what impresses me. A man that can, his lips speak wisdom. Verse 11, let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. You should seek peace. An intelligent man will have the ability to speak to someone in a bad situation and calm the situation down. You know what a good police officer is? A good police officer can come and he can de-escalate a bad situation. Same thing with the military. Hey, um, instead of us going to some kind of a battle and war where we're both going to lose a lot of people, why don't we talk this out peaceably? And I heard a guy say the one time, um, forget what his position was, he was some government guy or whatever else, I listened to a, a lecture that he gave and he said that uh, 
in warfare, he said, you have to, whenever you develop a war, you have to make a peaceable exit strategy that the enemy can take without losing honor. And I thought, wow, that's really good. And you know, I don't do that often when it comes to my preaching and teaching. I turn into a thing of where I get somebody and I corner them and I say, okay, the only way out of this is I'm going to humiliate you. Um, no, I need to be able to leave it away for these people to peaceably come out and say, hmm, yeah, I think he's right. <laughs> and sometimes I do that thing where I just embarrass people and I humiliate people, that my enemies, and just destroy them um, when I should actually give them a way that they can come out of it and retain the honor and not destroy them as men. In other words, retain their honor as a man and say, um, you know, hey, I was watching this uh, Brother Brian and, and uh, he made some really good arguments and whatever. Uh, I'm out of it now. I'm not going to be teaching what I used to teach or whatever else. Something that I need to work on. Um, be more scholarly and, and less, uh, you know, nasty about certain things. Um, just being honest. Um, verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are, op are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? Uh, you know, the Bible talks about the, the fruit of the Spirit, and against such there is no law. If you do that which is right, they really can't get you. My rights are unalienable. You can't go and take my God-given rights. And I'm doing good. I'm not a bad person. Verse 14. It doesn't always work out, though, because there are some very evil people. But if, but and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Be ready always. How do you do that? By increasing your understanding. If you're a righteous man, people will start to see it. Your co-workers will see it. People around you will see it. And they'll say, What's this uh, thing that you believe in? I'd like to hear more about that. You have something that I'd like to have. Verse 16. Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Uh, we're suffering right now for well-doing, brethren. If you stand by this book, you can say there are two genders in this book. It's not all these other things that are going on and all this perversion and all that other stuff out there. Um, I'm against that. And you don't have to get all offensive and whatever else and, you know, do the Westboro Baptist cult thing. Those people weren't even saved, by the way. There's video of them using all kinds of profanity and they were wicked. But coming out with a God hates fags or something. You don't need to do that. Come on. Where's it at in scripture? All right. Those words. It's not there. All right. You don't need to do that. Be a little bit more scholarly with the way that you handle things. Have righteous standards. And you see these Westboro Baptist cult satanic people. Um, they're just the devil's people trying to make Bible the Bible look bad. But they come out. They don't have personal standards of righteousness. They're just wicked, evil people. That's what they are. And the lost world can tell that. But if you come out and you truly are concerned and you say you're giving arguments, reading from the scriptures, you know, and the police come over. I saw there was some video. Some guy was out doing some kind of street preaching thing or whatever, and the police arrested him. Um, what you should do is you should just simply say, hey, you know what? Um, I'm out here to talk to these people to witness to them, to try to say if there's some sodomite pride rally or whatever, um, hey, you know, uh, this is wrong. This is condemned in the scriptures. And I can give you arguments also besides the scriptures to show that this is wrong. Um, oh, you need to get out of here. Okay. All right. Fine. Leave. Get to weigh that stuff out. But finally, let's talk about strength as a biblical man. Ephesians chapter 6. You say, Brother, this, you're sure making it sound like a difficult thing. Well, it is a difficult thing to be a righteous man, to be a real man 
in God's sight, in the sight of God and man. Um, you can go and you can yell and you can rant and you can rave and do your street preaching thing and do your soul winning and just, you know, be ultra radical and get everybody to hate your guts. But uh, it's a lot harder thing to be a man in front of them and to show, hey, I'm doing some things here. I'm, I'm going to, I'll be a good guy to you. I'll be nice to you. Kindness, you know, and whatever else, but I'm firm in my beliefs and my, and my convictions. I have a clean language. I have a clean, um, way that I handle people and whatever, that's a lot tougher, you know, and I have, I have known some of the most radical frothing at the mouth, street preaching guys, guys that do soul winning. And they're some of the most wicked men. When you get to know them personally, uh, they do all kinds of stuff. You wouldn't believe the stuff I've seen from some of those guys. Very, very wicked men. Uh, they're not real men. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 20. And I'm not condemning witnessing to people or straight preaching. So don't get that in you know, interpretation either. But you just have to watch that stuff. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 20. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Strong in the Lord. Okay, not in your own power. And in the power of His might, not your might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You have to remember that. It's not the Democrats. Okay? It's the devils. Uh, it's not the Republicans. It's the devils. All right? It's not the Illuminati or the Jesuits or the Freemasons or the Jewish Zionist international bankers. It's not the Bilderbergers, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, that you go down through the list. Uh, it's spiritual wickedness in high places. And as a biblical man, you have to think, okay, I have to get myself right with God. I have to have understanding. I have to have righteousness. And that can lead to the strength of the Lord being in my life because he won't resist me because I'm doing what he says according to his word. And then I can go out and I can wage warfare on the spiritual wickedness in high places. And I can affect elections. I can affect the way things are done in the nation. See, that's how we fight. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. All right. Um, we don't go out and we don't spread our faith with the sword. Okay. You might have to use it in defense sometimes. If it gets too bad, you might have to, to raise up the the sort of just defense, you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, that's there. It is. Um, you might have to get to a point where blood has to be shed. Okay. If it gets to that point where they're coming after you and you say, okay, I can't just stand here. I have to fight against this evil. Um, but we have to fight spiritually first. Very important. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Spiritual armor here. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, uh, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. already read that, but let's continue. Verse 13. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. How do you get truth? through understanding, through study, attaining unto wise counsel. And have, having on the breastplate of righteousness. You see the two there? You want to be a soldier for Jesus Christ? Okay. Understanding. Build up your mind. Don't waste your mind, your, your time on entertainment, useless entertainment. Build up your wisdom. Build up your understanding. And then righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Make sure you have the right one. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, 
for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Um, please do pray for me in that area, because I might end up being an ambassador in bonds. I hope not. I hope I don't have to go to prison. They say, you're not willing to suffer. Oh, I'm willing to suffer. That's not the issue. But uh, if preachers like me are put in bonds, if I go to prison, then it's going to be very hard for you to live out there. You better remember that. Uh, well, Brother Brian, if he goes to prison and whatever else, I'll be fine. They won't come for me. If they can get to the point, and I say they meaning the devil's servants, the people that the spiritual wickedness controls, spiritual wickedness in high places, if they can get to a point where they can silence me, life is going to be very bad for you. That's why I'm out here on the front lines of the battle and I'm fighting as hard as I can with the sword of the spirit, attacking these people. But I can't do it if I'm not a biblical man. If I don't have biblical masculinity where I can say, okay, I'm going to study, I'm going to have understanding up here. I'm going to do my best to help out my own family, protect my own family, but also protect you and teach you what you need to know to get you off of toxic chemicals, be it through food or through drugs or whatever else, to get you into the correct word of God, the scriptures, the King James Bible, based on the majority of extant Greek manuscripts. All right, It isn't that this is old and archaic and the new versions are better and easier to understand. No, the new versions come from the Vatican. All right, It's a completely different family of manuscripts, completely different Bible, and those things are accursed. You will never have power, spiritual power, through the new versions. Yes, you can get some truth from the new versions. Of course you can. You can get the truth from a Dewey Reams Bible. Again, I point down there because that's where it's at. I have an original uh, tried and true or whatever else Roman Catholic edition of the Dewey Reams as it was printed in 1610. You can get truth from that. I've preached out of that new version down there. Had a whole study you know, showing Catholics that even their own most sacred text Bible, you know, sacred scriptures, teaches how to be truly saved. Okay, you can teach that stuff. But if you want spiritual power, you have to use the King James Bible. And you get, I mean, there's so many attacks that I've answered over the years, people attacking this book right here. You have to understand these things. You have to have righteous standards. You have to take the sword of the Spirit and be willing to fight for it. You have to have strength. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Let's go back few books here first Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13 it says watch ye stand fast in the faith quit you like men be strong um, I grew up uh, my grandparents on my father's side my paternal grandparents were Mennonite my father was raised Mennonite um, grandpa was not a very good Mennonite to tell you a little story here, uh, he had some enemies. And um, the one time there was a guy, I don't know what the quarrel was about, but this guy literally called my grandfather on the phone and he said, I'm going to come right now and I'm going to kill you. My grandfather was an artist. He also made jewelry. I don't know if there was something business-wise that happened there. I have no idea. But this guy said, I'm coming and I'm going to kill you. And Grandpa said, come, I'm waiting for you. Guy pulled up at the end of the lane and Grandpa walked out and confronted the man to his face. Not a very good uh, pacifist. Um, he didn't hide in there and uh, whatever and, and things. And Grandpa was a very peaceful man. He was a very calm man, very calm spirited. I remember him. And um, But there were certain things you just didn't do. Uh, I don't know what their bedroom looked like at their house because I wasn't allowed to go back into that part of the house. As his grandson, I didn't go running through his house and jumping on a sofa and whatever. Oh my no. I never even opened up their refrigerator. We go over there to, to eat and everything else. And I would ask me, I please have you know something to drink or whatever. Oh sure, Brian, what would you like to have? And then, I'll get it for you. And they'd get up and they would get it for me. I wouldn't go over and just open up their refrigerator and look in and whatever. Um, but then again, the, the newer generations that are very wicked and whatever else, they don't have respect for the elderly. So there's major issues there. But um, my grandfather was not a very good Mennonite. He wasn't a very good pacifist. Uh, he was very, um, he wouldn't put up with things, say it that way. My father, who was 
began most, you know, his life as a Mennonite. Uh, he left the Mennonite church because it was too pacifistic and he got sick and tired of hearing all this pacifism stuff. And um, my, my father, he wouldn't put up with stuff either. And uh, I remember there was a guy that was stalking my mother um, before I was born. My father told me the story and he said this, this guy would kept, you know, he'd come past the house, you know, and whatever, slow down and look in and see if my mother was in the yard hanging up laundry or whatever. And uh, he kept doing this and uh, when my father would be at work. And so finally my father had enough of it and I guess he took a day off or something or I forget what the thing was. And he was, ended up chasing the guy in his car and uh, my father uh, pulled the guy over in the car and my father had a 12 gauge shotgun. He walked up and he stuck it right in the window of the guy, put it right towards his head and he said, okay, give me your driver's license. And the guy said, you can't do this. You can't do this. He said, I'm going to call the police. I'll, I'll tell the police about this. And my father cocked the hammer and he said, dead men don't talk. Give me your driver's license. <laughs> Got the driver's license out, handed it to my father. My father wrote down the, who the guy was and he said, okay, here's your license back. If I ever catch you coming near my wife again and my children, I will kill you. And the guy's, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And he drove off, never saw him again. Why? All because your father was, he had, he had, he was a white man and he was toxic masculine. Shut up. Okay. I hate that stuff. No, because my father was a real man. And I hope that if you're a black man or Hispanic or Oriental or whatever kindred you are, I hope that you're a real man too. It's not a, some kind of a thing of white men are aggressive and whatever. Real men are aggressive. Okay, real men will take strong stands and will say, you're not going to come and go after my wife or my children or whatever else. And you say, well, Brian, you haven't done anything like that. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Um, I've had to confront people. A um, story that I told a couple years ago, I guess two years ago or something like that, I fell down the steps in the ice. It was icy and we had our steps outside of our tiny home and I fell down it and had my back all messed up and black and blue really dark purple upper back the whole way down to my leg you know it was bad I thought I broke my back and thankfully I didn't but fell on my lower back which has been injured before so not good but uh, laying there in bed and somebody comes back our lane four o'clock in the morning um, still don't know what all oh, we got the wrong lane I don't think that they did. I think that they were back there to steal, but that's another issue. But I went out and I confronted them. Um, and I had to jump out of bed and was in my underwear and uh, had to go out there, zero degrees, barefoot, uh, gun in hand, confronting people, um, yelling like a madman. Um, I was very angry. And thankfully things worked out and I didn't have to shoot anybody, but if they had been there to harm my wife and my son and me, it wouldn't have gone well. Why? Because I've learned to be a man over the years. I'm not bragging about that. I don't want that. I, don't, I want to live peaceably. You see, Christian men want to live peaceably. Uh, oh, well, there's Catholics and they're taking over. They own, you know, their control of the Supreme Court and there's Jesuits here and Jesuits there and whatever else. Well, stay off my back and we'll get along. Go do your little wicked things and your scheming and whatever to bring in the Antichrist system. Whatever. Okay. Fulfill Bible prophecy. Go ahead. That's what you're supposed to be doing. But uh, leave me alone. Don't come for me. All right. You won't have any problems that way. But I'm going to fight you. I'm going to go against you. Can't stop what the Bible preordains. Sure. But I'm going to say, hey, you know what? I need to be left alone. Let me have my freedom. Because I'm a biblical man. And I strive to be more so all the time. If there's sin in my life, if there's some weakness in my life, then I need to get it purged out. 2 Samuel chapter 28. And I pray that you do the same. Oh, Denlinger's bragging. I'm not bragging. All right. I know my faults. I know my issues. I know my weaknesses. You know what makes me nervous? <laughs> I'll give you a good one. 2 Samuel 28. There is no 2 Samuel 28. Okay, I messed that up. Uh, maybe it's 1 Samuel 28. Um, 
you know what one of my weaknesses is one of the things that i'm that I, makes me nervous i'm not scared of it but it makes me nervous um okay maybe it's first samuel 28 uh, let me just look here real quickly no i think i got the wrong thing I'll look it up here. But one of the things that makes me very nervous is talking on the phone. Talking on the phone? Yeah. I can't stand it. If I have to call somebody, I get all nervous and I think, okay, how do I need to say this? And I, I try to think it all. I can't stand it. And I used to be, when, when I was younger and I'd be at home with my parents and things, I'd have my father call you know, different things for me and whatever. And then, you know what? I moved out and I got on my own. And then it was, huh, okay. I think I have to do this now. We'll have your wife call. Well, if it's something it's you know she could handle or whatever, okay, fine. Uh, but there's a lot of things I have to call. We need to talk to Mr. Denlinger. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's not First Samuel either. Um, I don't know, I got my scripture reference messed up here or something. Um, okay, 23, 2 Samuel chapter 23. I just look in here, found it. So, let me erase this and put 2 Samuel chapter 23 in my notes here. I don't know why I wrote, I guess because it's verse 8. So in my brain, I was thinking 28. Verse 8 was where we're going to start. We're going to read about some real strong men here, but uh, you'll know your weaknesses, okay? And what you can do if you're not a real man is you can say, well, I know what my weaknesses are, but I can find those same weaknesses in other men out there. I can find things where Brother Brian said that he used to do such and such, so because he used to do it, then I can do it now. And I know how it works. I used to do the same thing. You have to come to grips with yourself. Get a mirror and look into it and say, okay, you in the mirror, what's your problem? Where are you wrong? You're not much of a man, are you? Judge yourself. Second Samuel chapter 23, beginning in verse 8. Let's read about some real men here. These be the names of the mighty men. You'd like to be a mighty man in God's sight? The mighty men whom David had, the Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains, the same was Adino, Adino the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. Doesn't mean with one hit of his spear or something, but the whole point is in one fight he killed 800 men. You know? Uh, Carlos Hathcock the second, you know, the famous Marine Corps sniper in the Vietnam War, and he killed, you know, what two, three hundred confirmed kills. How about eight hundred with a spear, not a rifle? Scope thirty odd six. Uh, no, no, and a fifty caliber, fifty BMG. You know, if you study the story about Hathcock, um, I have. But uh, eight hundred men with a spear at one time. One battle, 800 men. Why would God write this in here if we're not supposed to look at this and think about this? As a man say, wow, that's pretty impressive. Verse 9, And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahoahite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered to get together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and the hand clave under the sword and the Lord wrought a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to spoil. There's a lot of great analogies there that you can make that I want my hand to be to cleave to the sword of the spirit so that I just can't separate this sword from myself, from my life and everything that I go through. Is there a verse on that? Yes, there's a verse. I can quote the verse on this and I can quote the verse on that. What a great thing. But what it's talking about is um, if you take a sword like this one here and you, you're out there fighting and you're 
thrusting and you're bringing it down like this and you just you're not taking your hand off the sword it's just staying on there um, I've had an experience not with a sword but with an axe where you start to if you're doing a lot of chopping a lot of things like that um, your hand starts to form to that and if you're out there for hour after hour chopping with that axe pretty soon you go to take your hand off and it's uh, and your hands you know still in the shape of the sword and you're going ah uh, uh, and you're trying to straighten your fingers your hand gets so tight around that sword and like I said I've only experienced it with an axe I've never used a sword to that level but I can see how it would happen see what's that all about it's called being a man um, I'll just say this again another little thing that I thank the Lord for uh, in high school, I had these real skinny little hands, just these little skinny fingers, and they were, you know, I was really tall and skinny, and uh, six foot four, 150 pounds, and, um, and my hands were just ridiculously little skinny fingers, and um, I got out of high school, and I started to learn about logging and things like that, and wood turning and whatever, and uh, I wanted to learn how to use an axe. And so I started to go out and I started using an axe and I'd learn how to split firewood and I'd learn how to use chainsaws and fell trees and all the other stuff, wood turning and, and using my hands a lot. And my hands got bigger and stronger and thicker. And, and I remember the one time I was at this Baptist church and this woman, she was a farm woman and she came up and I shook her hand and she said, you have the hands of a farmer. She said, you just big hands. And, and I, that was such an honor to me. And uh, because I was always so ashamed of my skinny little fingers. And um, now my hands are, you know, I've got scars on them from <laughs> where I, you know, cut part of my finger off over here the one time I was splitting kindling. True story. Uh, I have a new scar here, which is not very old from where I stuck my knife in my hand. Uh, deep puncture wound. I was trying to get the cap off of an olive oil bottle and I, and I wasn't thinking. It was early in the morning when we got here. Uh, probably about two months ago, I guess. And I was trying to get the cap off and it, it slipped and I went boom and just stuck my knife. This very knife right here. Um, this one stuck it right into my hand. And um, no stitches, just, you know, healed it up with yarrow. The herb yarrow. And, um, you know, I got a scar here and I got a scar right there. Real bad scar I've had for years that I was carving many years ago. And I my knife slipped off of the spoon that I was working on and I cut myself, went right down into the bone. And there I was taking a fan apart and I, I got a, went right down in, cut the tenon in half that never was reconnected. So I can't go the whole way up with my thumb like this anymore. And it's the marks of a man. And I look at that and I don't look at it with pride. I just look at it and say, I'm glad Lord put me through all this stuff. I'm glad that I can be like that guy. I can relate in some way. And um, he's a lot more honorable than me out there fighting against the enemies of the Lord with his sword and his hands cleaving to that sword, clave to it. But I want to be that way with the book, with the Bible. And again, brethren, I'm telling you these stories. There's a lot of you out there that you have the scars. You have the marks of being a real man. Great. Good for you. You've learned those things. You've learned the benefit of building character over the years. Uh, in many ways, you've gotten your hands burned while changing oil or fixing a car part or you know, banging your knuckle or something or smashing your thumb when you're swinging a hammer or what, cutting yourself with a knife or getting cut and whatever else. Um, those are good things. Helps you to be a man. My son here just a few days ago, I think two days ago, when we were helping people get the old backhoe out of the yard, the different guys from local farmers that they wanted it, helping them, got it all done. They got it loaded. They took off. And my son went down to show my wife where things were at. And he came walking up, tripped on the, something came down. There was a stick sticking up, hit him right in the neck and just, and just cut him really bad right here in the neck, not stitches or anything like that. But I'm saying, um, it cut him bad, you know, very painful. And he came in and, and um, he wasn't wailing and screaming and crying. It was just a little bit, oh, you know, it hurts. And fixed him up, cleaned it up, put some yarrow in a Band-Aid. And he still has 
you know, it's going to take a few days to heal the thing. But he's becoming a man. He has scars. He has a scar on his forehead from when he was a little boy. He fell, you know, out hiking and things in the woods. Um, and I tell him, I say, well, it's good for you, son. You're building character. Well, Dad, you know, Dad, don't you care? <laughs> of course I care. But what I'm trying to help you to understand is you're trying to, it's God's way of helping you to become a man so that you're not some kind of little perfumed princess that sits around on satin pillows and doesn't want to get cut or hurt or anything else. Uh, it's a good thing for a man to go through some stuff. Let's continue reading here about some more mighty men. Verse 11. And after him was Shema, the son of Agi, the Harite, Harite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he, the people fled away, but he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. Hmm. Um, we're not supposed to be doing that stuff physically right now, unless you know war would be brought against us, then that's a different story. But the whole thing is, I'd like to have that kind of a thing there. Uh, the Lord wrought a great victory. Why? He stood in the midst of the ground and defended it. Isn't that a great testimony? I'm going to stand my ground and I'll defend with the sword of the Spirit. And my hand will cleave to this book. You won't move me from it. Well, you can have certain parts of the Bible, but other parts need to be rewritten because the World Economic Forum said so. Then the World Economic Forum people can go to hell and burn forever. You're not going to take the book from me. I'm a, what Obama called a bitter clinger. You're not taking my book. You're not going to get me to back down on what this book says. Well, certain things back then that they had in the ancient times, we understand better now. No, no. I'm going to stand my ground and the Lord can raw, he can have a great victory wrought through me because I'm going to stand my ground. Because that's what a man does. A righteous, godly man stands his ground. Well, brother, you know, back in the past, uh, or Brian, you know, back in the past, uh, people were against uh, interracial marriage and things. They had anti-miscegenation laws in this nation, but we know better now. Uh, no, we don't. Um, I still stand against it because the Bible speaks against it. There were times that it happened and God said, okay, these people are together and whatever. There were times that he overlooked it. Okay. Um, there were certain things that happened there. The book of Ruth is one of the examples. I've talked about that in my studies. You can watch that. But the fact is, they had a reason to be against interracial marriage. That's why they had anti-miscegenation laws in this country. And look what happened after that. Now that you can have interracial marriages, now all of a sudden, an interracial marriage, by the way, the reason it's, it's condemned in Scripture is because it destroys what God created. It destroys true culture and ethnicities and things like that. It's not about one race being better than the other. It's about the races being different and separate. That's what the Tower of Babel was all about. God loves native cultures. That's why you stay separate. Because when you blend, you lose those distinctions. Okay? That's what it's about. It's not about hatred. All right? And I get so sick and tired of people, oh, you're racist because you're against interracial marriage. I'm not a racist. I'm for biblical separation and culture and preservation. I'm not a black man, and I don't want to force black men to be like me. I want them to preserve their ancestral ways and their heritage and their culture. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. Look over there at Africa and the traditional dress and everything else and the traditional ways that those people have. Beautiful. Absolutely wonderful. If I'd ever get a chance to go to Africa, I want to see African people with African culture not African people with white culture and take it to any other kindred out there. Okay. I'll go off that rant here for a minute, but the whole point is that elimination of the anti-miscegenation laws by two Jesuit lawyers um, in 1962, you can look it up, the Loving versus Virginia debacle. They got rid of that and all of a sudden now, oh, hey, we have to be okay with sodomy. And people said, okay, we're okay with sodomy. Oh, now we have to be okay with uh, transgender, transvestite, transgenderism and whatever. And then, oh, now it'll be a pedophilia. We're minor attracted or whatever. No, 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 no. A righteous man stands his ground. But brother, all the other Christians have fled. They've all left the ground there. 
but I'm going to stand my ground and the Lord can rot, he can uh, have a great victory wrought through me because I'm going to cleave unto his word. That's biblical masculinity. What if you could lose your job? Then God will give you a better job. God will help you to be self-employed or do something else or you won't have to think about it. You see? Stand. Stand. That's what we're supposed to do. 1 Corinthians... Um, do we go to 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13? 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Doing, doing too much ranting and uh, forgetting if I went here already. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. I think we went to that already, but let me just see it here. Yeah, watch ye stand fast in the faith, quit you like men be strong. Yes, we did go to that. Okay, then 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That's where we'll end our study. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I mean, do, do what you can, you know. I'm not trying to pressure people. Oh, you have to be a perfect level and you never make a mistake and whatever. No, brethren. Um, I'm just saying, find a way that you can fight. If you're a man, a, a Christian man, find something that you can stand for. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 through 23. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a future. We know what's coming in the future. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back for his bride, for his church. You're part of it if you're saved. So there's going to be a helicopter lift out at some point in time. The Lord's going to say, okay, come up hither. The world's going to get worse. But that doesn't mean that you have to go along with it. It doesn't mean that you have to just be a little mousy man and just, well, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to be offensive and whatever. No, we have to have understanding as biblical men. We have to be righteous and we have to be strong. That's biblical masculinity. Um, and those are the three different things. And I'll tell you right now, the hardest one, there you have the spirit. The spirit is understanding. Probably can't see it, but I'm just holding it up. The soul is righteous. Those two are difficult, but you can do it. You can have understanding. You can binge watch these videos. You can watch a bunch of other stuff out there. You can get some pretty good understanding. You can be righteous. You can clean up your life, but boy, oh boy, what about that body there, the flesh, the strength, when you're tempted to be weak? When you're tempted to keep your mouth shut, when you're tempted to say, well, I probably shouldn't say this or do that or whatever. Uh, I can tell you right now, this is, there's a lot of, I'm attacking here. This is a rough sermon and kicking you pretty hard. I'm sure out there, if you're a biblical saved man, and, and even for the sisters out there, you know, you can have your own issues and things like that where you need to take stands and, and whatever. But I'm kicking myself through this whole study too. And I'll tell you right now, there have been so many times when I have put together a sermon and I go to preach it and the Holy Spirit says, say this. And, you know, and it comes into my mind. It's not in my notes. All right. And it, I know it's not my flesh. And I think, oh boy. And I think I'm going to get in trouble with this group and with that group. My family is going to hate me even more. And, <laughs> and I think, oh boy. And I'm probably going to lose subscribers. And I'm going to, oh yeah, I know that that guy watches me and this woman watches me and that this family and, and they, you know, I know that they don't believe it. And I think, uh, is it in the Bible? Yes, it is. All right. I'm just going to have to say it, <laughs> you know, and there've been so many times I literally think to myself, I get the video done here. It goes over the computer, uploads to the computer. I edit it. I render it. It's ready to upload to YouTube. And I think this is going to get me in a lot of trouble if I upload this boy, if I release this, I mean, I've literally hesitated my fingers above the mouse and I'm thinking, Am I sure I want to put this out? Because it's really going to, you know, my name will be mud for sure if I put this out. And the Lord says, I want it out. All right, click. <laughs> Upload. Release. Make it public. Boom. 
Oh, brother Brian, you sure are a real man. Oh, no, not really. I strive to be. But uh, I know my fears. And that's what you have to get to, brethren. If I could define biblical masculinity with one phrase, it would be knowing what your problems are and going ahead and fighting against those problems. Knowing where you're ignorant and you need to increase understanding. Um, knowing where you're slipping a little bit with your righteous standards and saying, I need to purge out that stuff out of my life. Knowing where you're weak and where you need to be strong. And being strong, like I said, is not, you know, I can cuss anybody out, I can talk the talk, and I can be a tough guy. No, no. That stuff's a show. You know, it's funny, a lot of wild animals I've encountered over the years, bears and things like that, big bull moose and, and whatever, which they usually aren't too bad, but you get them in, at the wrong time, they can get a little bit nasty. But, you know, things like that. I've had a mountain lion stalking me out in Montana, and I've, you know, I've never seen a grizzly bear close up or whatever, but I've been in areas where they are, and, you know, I've been around wild animals, and a lot of times they will bluff you. Um, they'll kind of try to feel you out and sort of come towards you or whatever a little bit and um i've never been attacked by a wild animal and you yell and whatever else and you say get on get out of here and you you know raise your voice and most of the time oh okay you know they're acting tough until you go on get out of here and of course dogs you know i've had plenty of run-ins with dogs over the years and they're barking and whatever else and you say now stop that come on hey quit you know and whatever you speak to them like a man and all of a sudden you see the tail, you know, and whatever, and the tail starts to wag slightly. And, you know, yeah, come on, you're a big baby, come on. You know? And I've seen, I've had some confrontation with some big dogs, you know, and you can get in, in control over them. Um, but only if you're a man. Um, and you have to understand that stuff. I mean, I could go off on this subject for a very long time, but I've, ranted and raved enough in this study um, I have not attained I have not achieved the point of where I want to be yet um, I am certainly I don't look at myself in the mirror and just yeah yeah I'm a real man I'm a tough guy no I know my weaknesses I know what I need to work on and don't come to me and say brother Brian can you please tell me where I'm weak and no that's between you and God I gave you the scriptures that you need to go through. You need to say, okay, understanding, righteousness, and strength. How am I doing in those three areas? Where am I wrong? Where am I off? And get it figured out between you and God. I hope it's been a challenge to you, brethren, because it's been a challenge to me. It helps me to review myself and review my life, and I have to think about what do I need to do? Where can I improve myself? in those three categories. Um, think about it. Okay, we're going to see you in the next study, hopefully. <laughs> um, again, if you uh, like the video, do the little like thing and whatever so YouTube doesn't completely bury the videos. <laughs> I'd like them to get to some people. Share the videos because YouTube isn't about to. And uh, if you want to subscribe to the channel, if you're watching a lot of videos, subscribe until you're done watching and then unsubscribe, whatever. But uh, you know, that stuff helps. I don't really care about that, but unfortunately I have algorithms and computer artificial intelligence, you know, uh, automated devils or something I like to call them. Uh, I don't really consider them to be robots, but uh, I think it's just devils could probably take up residence with some of the stuff, but that's another issue. But uh, they're against what I do and against what I'm saying. So I need people to click the like button and leave a comment. And even if it's just, hey, great study, thank you, or whatever, um, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, whatever else. I'm not monetized. That's not what it's about. It just helps to get the videos out there so people that are searching can find them. Um, please do that. I know it's easy to forget. That you, you know, you're watching a bunch of my videos. and Oh, there's another one. I'd like to see that. And you click on the other one. I forgot to hit the like button or I forgot to leave a comment or something like that. You know, do what you can to help to promote the ministry. I would appreciate that very much. I'm trying to reach people. And it irritates me that I have um, people that are fighting against that goal. So, 
that is going to be it. I have one more study to do today on uh, Final Authority, not Sola Scriptura. So you can look for that study coming up. Um, I am going to be doing some other things here with answering letters and whatnot. I have some other studies that I'm working on. Very busy as always. So um, please do keep me in your prayers. Thank you to those out there that support the ministry. And we will see you in the next study. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17-18. through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.